Hello everyone! Today we are going to talk about Takayasu Arteritis. Let's begin with an introduction. Takayasu Arteritis is granulomatous vasculitis of large and medium arteries, but it is classified as a large vessel vasculitis because it primarily affects the aorta and its primary branches. Women are affected in 80 to 90 percent of cases with an age of onset that is usually between 10 and 40 years. It is characterized principally by ocular disturbances and marked weakening of pulses in the upper extremities. This leads to the name pulseless disease. It is also characterized by a strong predilection for aortic arch and its branches. This gives the name aortic arch syndrome or giant cell aortitis. Morphological changes in the vessel wall are the same as in giant cell arteritis. Next, we'll consider the pathophysiology. The pathogenesis of Takayasu arteritis, sometimes abbreviated TAK, is poorly understood. Cell-mediated mechanisms are thought to be of primary importance and may be similar to those in giant cell arteritis, often abbreviated GCA. Immunohistopathologic examination has shown that the infiltrating cells in aortic tissue mainly consist of cytotoxic lymphocytes, especially gamma-delta T lymphocytes. These cells may cause vascular injury by releasing large amounts of the cytolytic protein perforin. Next, consider the morphology. Gross specimen is showing extensive intimal thickening with attenuation of the media and adventitial fibrosis. Microscopy will show degeneration of the media with a dense inflammatory infiltrate, including giant cells. Now we'll consider the clinical features. First, let's consider constitutional symptoms. Constitutional symptoms are common in the early phase of TAK, including weight loss and low-grade fever. Fatigue is very common. Next are arthralgias. Arthralgias, or myalgias, occur in about one half of cases. There is also carotidnea. Tenderness of a carotid artery, known as carotidnea, is observed in 10 to 30 percent of patients at presentation. Absent or diminished peripheral pulses is most common at the level of the radial arteries and is often asymmetric. Another clinical feature is limb claudication. Limb claudication may be observed. Subclavian artery involvement is common, and a stenotic lesion proximal to the origin of the vertebral artery can lead to neurologic symptoms or syncope related to the so-called subclavian steel syndrome. In this phenomenon, retrograde flow through the vertebral artery supplies the subclavian distal to the stenosis and vasodilation of the arterial bed in the upper limb with exercise compromises posterior cerebral blood flow. Other vessels involved are common carotid, abdominal aorta, celiac, superior mesenteric, renal, vertebral, iliac, pulmonary, and coronary arteries, though this is the least common. Another feature is arterial brute. In patients with stenosis, brutes are usually audible over the subclavian arteries, brachial arteries, carotid arteries, and abdominal vessels. The last feature is hypertension. Hypertension develops in more than one half of cases due to narrowing of one or both renal arteries, or narrowing and decreased elasticity of the aorta and branches, severe or malignant hypertension may occur. We'll discuss the physical examination. Several aspects of the physical examination merit particular attention whenever a patient with TAK is seen in clinical practice. Measurement of blood pressure should be done in all four extremities to evaluate for arterial stenosis and accurately measure the true central arterial pressure. Many patients with TAK will have partial or complete occlusion of one 
or both subclavian, axillary, or brachial arteries, or the brachiocephalic artery, leading to falsely low pressure readings in the ipsilateral arm. Now let's continue with a discussion about the diagnosis. For diagnosis, the American College of Rheumatology requires three of the six criteria, age at disease onset being less than or equal to 40 years, claudication of extremities, decreased brachial artery pulse, blood pressure difference, of greater than 10 millimeters per mercury between arms, brute over subclavian artery or aorta, or arteriogram abnormality. Another topic to consider is laboratory findings. Laboratory abnormalities in patients with TAK are nonspecific and generally reflect an inflammatory process. Acute phase reactants, such as erythrocyte sedimentation rate, abbreviated ESR, and C-reactive protein, abbreviated CRP, may be elevated. Our last major topic will be on the treatment of Takayasu arteritis. First, consider the overall approach. The mainstay of therapy for Takayasu arteritis is systemic glucocorticoids. However, given the chronic, relapsing nature of the disease, and the imperativeness to avoid glucocorticoid-related toxicities, patients are often prescribed a non-glucocorticoid immunosuppressive agent in an attempt to provide both a steroid-sparing benefit and longer-term disease control. The initial dose of glucocorticoids depends on the nature and severity of the disease activity. In patients with new-onset arterial stenosis, and or symptoms of involvement of critical region, for example, aortitis or carotidemia, the dose of oral prednisone is typically one milligram per kilogram per day, up to a maximum daily dose of 60 to 80 milligrams, and should be continued for two to four weeks, at which time tapering of the dose should begin if patients demonstrate clinical improvement. Glucocorticoids are administered as a single daily morning dose. Let's discuss a few images related to Takayasu arteritis. The first image is Takayasu aortitis on MRI. The image is of a 33-year-old man with Takayasu aortitis. The MRI shows narrowing of the region of the isthmus shown by the arrowhead, as well as diffuse irregular narrowing of the abdominal aorta shown with the arrow. This next image is fusiform aneurysm and wall thickening in a patient with Takayasu arteritis. Enlargement of the descending thoracic aorta and thickening of the vessel wall shown by the arrows is apparent in this contrast-enhanced CT scan. These findings suggest an active inflammatory process. This third image is of a fusiform aneurysm. Enlargement of the contrast-filled descending thoracic aneurysm has occurred despite treatment with glucocorticoids. This next image is Takayasu aortitis on aortography, a 13-year-old female with Takayasu aortitis. The aortogram shows tubular narrowing of the isthmus of the aorta shown by the arrow. This fifth image is of Takayasu arteritis. An angiogram of a child with Takayasu arteritis showing massive bilateral carotid dilation, stenosis, and post-stenotic dilation. This last image is great vessel stenosis. This is an angiography of the thoracic aorta, specifically the left anterior oblique view of a patient with Takayasu arteritis. Stenoses, which have examples indicated by white arrows, are seen in the innominate, left common carotid, and left subclavian arteries. An injection catheter is seen in the dilated ascending aorta, shown by the green overlay. This concludes our video on Takayasu arteritis. Thank you so much for watching, and have a wonderful rest of your day.